you can turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. That's the portion that I'll be preaching from. We are beginning a new series today in Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians. We kind of began it last week as we had a psalm that we're, for our psalm of focus that we're singing in connection with this series. But today, we're actually getting into the book of Thessalonians itself. In this book, we have a model church for us to imitate and to learn from. The church of the Thessalonians was made up, as we're told in Acts 17, of a few Jews a great multitude of devout Greeks, and a few leading women who responded to Paul's preaching when he went to the synagogue at Thessalonica after having been persecuted in Philippi. Thessalonica was a principal city in Macedonia. The work of God in the Thessalonians was quite remarkable because they believed the message that Paul and Silas, or Silvanus as he's called here, and Timothy had proclaimed when they came to them and preached in the synagogue on only three Sabbaths. The reason they were only there for three Sabbaths is because the unbelieving Jews, the ones who did not receive the message that Messiah had come, rose up against the Apostle Paul and his companions and they were so violent that Paul had to be whisked away by night to Berea. And their aggression was so strong that these unbelieving Jews pursued Paul even to Berea. And he had to be whisked away again and taken by sea to Athens in order for his safety. Now you would think that it would be very unlikely that only having been among them for those three Sabbaths, and having seen that kind of reception, that anyone would want to follow these men who had brought that message. Their community had risen up against it. And yet the remarkable thing is, is that this model church of the Thessalonians, they did believe that message. And so when Paul writes to them, he writes to them after having been concerned about them and sending his co-worker Timothy back to Thessalonica to see how they were doing, and Timothy came back with a report that they were doing quite well, that they were continuing in the Lord. And Paul rejoices to hear this good news, and he writes to them a letter that, among all of the letters that he wrote, is one of the least critical letters in terms of him criticizing or, or rebuking the people for their errors. The Thessalonians were faithful. And so he's commending them. So we have here a model church, not one like the Corinthians where one thing after another had to be corrected, but a church that was walking with the Lord. So it's a very helpful thing for us to, to study this church that we might see how they became a model church. It was, it was through the gracious working of God and that we might see the things that are important for them to know as a model church and how to be, how to continue to be a model church as we would desire to be a model church in our community of God's people. Keep in mind that all of Paul's letters are written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they're God-breathed. God has given the words to Paul. He's, he's so carried him along, the Spirit has carried him along as he writes, so that the things he writes are the very word of God. There's nothing in his letters that is not helpful for us to know and to, to use in our walk. We can receive it all as the word of God, because that's exactly what it is. Paul knew that when he wrote this, as we'll see later on in the letter, and the people who receive these words, the Thessalonians, recognize that, that Paul the Apostle is speaking the word of God. So by preaching from these letters to the Thessalonians, it is my prayer that God's Spirit will use these sermons to help us to be a model church in Halifax, and that we will see how the Lord works in His people, that we might put our hope not in ourselves, but in Him, and that we might rejoice in His goodness. And today as we begin, our focus will be particularly on that last part, to rejoice in God's goodness. That we might learn to give thanks for the God who raises up faithful churches. 
to delight in the God who raises up faithful churches in this world. That will be our focus. We will, today, we will begin looking by looking at the first five verses where we have Paul and his companions, Silas and Timothy, giving thanks to God for the church at Thessalonica. They wrote this letter, in a sense, together. Paul is the principal author. Sometimes he speaks in the first person, but very often he speaks uh, in the third person. In the, not the not third person, I'm sorry. He speaks in the plural. He, he, he speaks in the singular sometimes, and he speaks in the plural sometimes. And uh, we, we have, uh, he, he has these companions, though, Timothy and Silas or Silvanus that w- was with him. Silvanus was... Uh, a man from Jerusalem that had trusted the Lord, and he was well respected so that the Jews maybe would be more likely to receive the message when Silvanus was there. And Timothy was a young disciple that Paul had led to the Lord at Lystra and carried along with him on his uh, missionary journeys. Paul and his companions in writing this know that God is the one who formed this faithful church. And that can be seen by the fact that as soon as he addresses them in verse 1, he testifies in verse 2 of his constant thanks that he has, he and his co-workers. So this should teach us how thankful we should be for believing churches. So listen now as I read these first five verses of Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians to you. I'll begin with verse 1. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. And remember, this is the holy an infallible word of God. It it begs for your attention. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. May the Lord bless the hearing of his holy and infallible word. May he give us the gratitude that we see here in Paul and his companions. Yes, indeed. First point, how you ought to thank God for faithful churches wherever you find them. Just think what a church is. Paul describes the church in Thessalonica in verse 1 as the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They're Thessalonians. They're just people who perhaps were born in Thessalonica, who live there, who work there, and they're brought into a church, an ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word that we translate church in our Bibles. And as I've mentioned to some of you before, the the word ecclesia could be any kind of assembly. It was used for the Greeks when they had political assemblies to gather together to transact business for their city or, or, or for their province or whatever it might be. So there were political ecclesias and now here is a church that we, is what we call a church, a Christian ecclesia. These Thessalonians to whom Paul is writing are an ecclesia in Thessalonica that is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful thing because many of these people had been idol worshipers and now they're in God the Father and in Christ Jesus. And many of them who were Jews did not yet know that God had sent the Messiah into the world that they had been seeking. But now they had received him when he was proclaimed to him them. So now all of these were together in God the Father, and Christ Jesus the Lord. Now that, you say, well, of course that's true. But that is a marvelous thing. You need to stop and think about what a marvelous thing it is that these people who are outside of God are now in God and in Christ Jesus. Just think what it means to be in the Father and in the Son. On our own, 
we are miserable, wretched, condemned sinners who are cut off from God without any hope in the world. We are under his wrath and curse, and there is no way for us to turn. But to be in him is now to have communion with him restored, to have complete forgiveness of sins through Jesus who died on the cross. He is the one who came to bear the sins of his people, and he has done it. All who believe in him have forgiveness of sin and new life in God forever and ever that will never be taken away from them. In God, they are embraced. They are loved. They are protected. They are nurtured. They are renewed, justified, adopted, sanctified, and destined for heaven. With all of their enemies coming against them, what a comfort it was to know that they are in God and in Christ Jesus and that never could that be taken away. Death could not separate them from the love of God in Christ. What a marvelous thing it is that there are people in the world today that were lost and undone as we all are that are now in the Father and in the Son by God's mercy. There are people in Halifax that are in the Father and in the Son who otherwise would be completely without hope. Many of you gathered here today are in the Father and in the Son. And this is a marvelous most excellent thing. Nothing can be compared to this. Paul gives thanks for churches all the time. He cannot mention a church without breaking away to say, I give thanks for what God has done. His testimony is tremendous. He can't even get to the second verse in this epistle before he's already talking about how thankful he is that there are these ones who are in God and in Christ. Almost all of his letters begin with that kind of thanksgiving. Some of the uh, academic type commentators say, oh, Paul has a form in his letters and he has this thanksgiving section that occurs in all of his letters and they kind of dissect it like that and they make it sound like it's just sort of a thing that's just sort of a form letter. But it was not that way at all for the Apostle Paul. His heart was moved whenever he spoke and addressed them to the saints at Ephesus or wherever they are. And then he broke forward saying, I give thanks for you. At some point early in all of his letters except one. And that is the letter to the Galatians. And do you know why he didn't give thanks then? Because they had departed from the gospel. And he was writing a severe letter of warning to call them to repentance and to call them to come back. So his thanksgiving is not just part of a form letter. It's an expression of his true thanks for what they have done. Now I wonder, do you give thanks for the church wherever you find it? Does it cause thanksgiving to well up within you whenever you run across God's people in a place? Those in Halifax, Haligonians that are in Christ Jesus. Those who are in some other city that are in Christ Jesus. We traveled around recently, going all the way across the country. What a delight it was to see those who are in Christ Jesus in this city and that city. And not only that, but do you actually thank God in in your sessions of prayer? You see, that's what Paul is talking about, that he and his companions regularly make mention of the, to give thanks for these ones in their actual words of prayer. That's important. Don't just feel thankful. Don't just say, well, oh, I'm thankful in my heart. That's very important. You should be thankful in your heart. But do you give expression to God in words when you gather to pray? Do you thank God? Do you actually speak to Him? See, the prayers of the Greeks in Paul's day were very much concerned with getting things from God. And they would meet, bring arguments and things to their gods and try to manipulate and get their gods to do whatever it was that they wanted. I did this for you, so you do this for me. That, that kind of a thing going on. Christian prayers were different because they were saturated with thanksgiving. Yes, we're to ask God for things. We're to bring our supplications to Him. He tells us to do so, and we ought well to do that. But we're also to give thanks to him. And that's what we find is unique about Christian prayers. So evaluate your prayers. Are they saturated with lots of thanksgiving? Or are they all just give me, give me, give me? 
You pray for someone else and you say, oh God, help so-and-so. And you don't say, God, thank you that so-and-so is in Christ Jesus. Thank you that that church over there is in Christ Jesus. And then you pray for them as you, as you have given thanks to them. Failure to thank God for his wonderful work of gathering sinners to himself, for having people who are in him and in Christ has very adverse consequences. When you, when you don't do this, it, it's very, very harmful. It makes you cold toward God. To have such a gracious, marvelous work of God before your eyes of people that have been redeemed by him and to not say thank you. Your heart will grow cold toward the Lord your God if you do not give thanks to him. When you do not thank him for his great work, you also cease to appreciate that work. You're not looking at it for what it is, and you become indifferent about that work. And when you don't appreciate what he's done, then you'll not commend him to others. You won't call us, come and see what God is going to come and join us. God has redeemed his people. He's blessed us. We are people in God, in Christ. Come and join us and be with us. Or promote the, the grace of God. You don't see much to promote. You never gave thanks for it. You don't care about it. This will hamper your own growth in your prayers. Because if you delight in God's work and his people, then you will be yearning for his ongoing work in your life. You'll be reading his word and seeking to follow him and, and to live before him and commune with him. And you will be crying out to him for these things. But if you don't care about his work, if it doesn't make much difference to you, then you're, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Because you're not cherishing these things of God, you will be drawn more and more into the things of the world. The temptations of the world will seem very attractive. The things that the Bible calls deceitful lusts, the things that bring death and ruin, they will be very attractive to you, very appealing to you, because you're not looking at the wonderful things that God has for his people, the wonderful things that God does for his people. So everything around you, it may not even always be sinful things, but you'll just be drawn away. Your affections will be on all these, my house and my car and all, all these other things that will, will captivate your heart because you're not rejoicing in what God has done. You don't get it. You don't see the value and the beauty of it. And then you will also be very deficient in helping others in their walk. You know, the best you'll be able to do is to tell them, hey, you're doing a great job if you see them kind of being faithful and stuff like that. That's not really that much help. You know what people really need to hear? It's, Man, I can see that God is working in you. Every time I see you, if it's true, I give thanks for what God is doing in your life. That's what encourages people. You just say you're doing a great job. Like, what is that? How am I going to continue? I don't know. It's not, I know it's not all that great. But if they tell me I see God working in you and I'm giving thanks, then I'm encouraged and I have hope and I'm motivated to seek God and to go forward. See, this is very, very important that, that we learn to do what Paul does. All of his letters, and here in Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians, giving thanks for the people of God. Now, secondly, I want to, you to see as his example, especially be thankful for the new life that God has given his people in their salvation. This is what Paul does in verse 3. He says he remembers without ceasing he says to the Thessalonians, your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just think of Christ, how Christ has turned these people around. Grace is abounded to them so that they have this triad that we run across in the Bible of faith, hope, and love as it's often presented. Here it's faith, love, and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Like Paul, give thanks for each component in this triad whenever you see it, in fellow believers, in, a, in churches around you. Give thanks to God when you see their work of faith. The Thessalonians had turned from idols to serve the living God. That was a work of faith 
It was done out of faith because they believed. Faith had turned them from idol worshipers into followers of Christ. Now they were serving him and their fellow believers, even in the face of opposition. That's what faith does. It follows Christ. Faith without works is dead. It's not really faith. It's not living faith. Paul was so thankful to see faith that was working in the Thessalonians, that was doing work. Give thanks when you see the work of faith in those around you. There is one who is a drunkard, but now he is filled with God's spirit. Look at what he's doing now. He used to go to the bottle. Now he is worshiping God. He is leading his family and worshiping God instead of being absorbed in, him, in himself and his own desires, caring for them who used to only care for himself and think of his own things. And there is the one who used to be a hardened secularist, the professor who used to destroy the faith, teaching the foolish doctrine that the world came about of itself. And now he is spreading the truth about the living God. Or the former activist who marched in the, in the pride parade, promoting sin and debauchery around the city. Faith has set her free, and now she is living a pure and holy life in service to God. Give thanks for the work of faith when you see it. And over there are the, those former ritualists who used to bury the truth in all sorts of rituals and traditions and who did not know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And now they have come to know God through Christ and are worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. The work of faith is seen. Now they are spreading the gospel of free grace instead of relying on their own works and leading others into that despairing path. Faith has made them alive and produced work in them. Secondly, give thanks when you see their labor of love. Jesus said that the people, people would know that we are his disciples by the love that we have for one another. That's what characterizes us as his people. He said that after he had washed his disciples' feet on the night when none of them felt that they were, they felt too high and mighty to wash one another's feet. They, it was too lowly a task for them to do. When God gathers us to himself, you see, as his people, he puts love in our heart for Christ and for others. And that love shows itself in labor. It's not just a feeling. It's the toil, the labor of love. The word there is a word that refers to toil. Love is willing to sacrifice for others, to pour itself out for others. How Paul gave thanks when he saw this among the Thessalonians. Think of what was going on with the Thessalonians. They were being persecuted. No doubt this would have affected some of their employment, some of their businesses. They would have been brought, some of them would have been brought into hard times. And it was very likely that these saints were, were going, the other, other believers that were able to do so were, were helping them and providing for them, giving sacrificially to their needs. We know that they gave to the church in Jerusalem who was in that situation, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, being brought into hard times through persecution and being brought into poverty. And they were sending relief to them, the saints from Thessalonica. It was a labor of love. It was a sacrifice of love. We know that they also pursued Paul as he went around with his ministry and sought how they might be able to help him and bring assistance to him. They were willing to, to lend a hand. Some may have been in prison. They went and visited those who were in prison, maybe endangering themselves that they might be taken prisoner as a, as a, a co-worker with those who are there. It's a tremendous thing, and Paul delight in it. Love is diligent. It doesn't shrink, shrink from service, but it looks for ways to be a blessing to others. We can see this love in lots of other ways also. We can see it in those who are full of bitterness and pride, and now they're full of looking, now they look to others as more important than themselves. Instead of wanting others to fail and being bitter toward them, they want to be a blessing. Instead of hateful words of resentment and anger, they speak words of edification and grace. We see, we see those who used to be lazy, but the gospel has changed them so that now they want to serve. 
They are diligent in the home. They are diligent in the workplace. They are there not for themselves, but for others. Thank God when you see these things. It is a wonderful thing that He has done. And next we see from Paul's example that we should give thanks for patience or for the endurance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ when we see it in believers. The endurance of hope was something that stood out in the Thessalonians. It stands out whenever there is a lot of opposition and persecution. Endurance of hope has two parts. First is the assurance that the affliction will not last forever, that it will end. So it enables you to bear it. It's not going to be always this way. And secondly, it is the assurance of God's promises, will, that God's promises will be fulfilled. Especially that Jesus will come in glory and that he will take us to glory. If the Thessalonians had not had this hope in Christ, they never would have come to him in the first place. They would have said, okay, so you're telling us about this great thing of following Christ, and you're calling us to come and do this. You just came from, from Philippi with wounds on your back, and now you're here. You're getting driven out of our town. They want to kill you, and you think this is a good thing? You want us to join this? If they didn't have hope, that God's promises were real, they never would have even started following the Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine that, that Paul was preaching. Yet, after only three weeks of preaching at the synagogue, they were already being opposed with great violence. You see, they had this hope in Christ. Put yourself in the place of those who are being drawn to him at this time. You would think twice before you went to follow this doctrine, seeing the consequences of it. But because they believed it was true, they received the word, as it says later in the epistle, with much affliction. So we find this triad, faith, hope, and love in the Bible a lot. But did you notice with the Thessalonians, I mentioned it already, that it's rearranged here. It's faith, love, and hope. Why is that? Well, it's because when Paul is writing to these churches, he puts the most important thing that they need at the end to emphasize it. Remember when he wrote to the Corinthians? What were they lacking? Love. So he said, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And he went on to explain why that was so. But with the Thessalonians, what did they need more than anything? They needed hope because they were being afflicted. So he puts hope at the end. Hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's hope that kept them going in their afflictions. And they know that there is an end and that God's promises will be fulfilled. That's what kept them going. Paul said, if we only have hope in this life, then we're of all people most miserable. But because we have hope, we endure. Well, do you give thanks when you see believers keeping on for the Lord despite all sorts of afflictions and, and persecutions and oppositions when you see them enduring in hope? If the gospel is in you, you will rejoice when you see that. You won't go, oh, but you'll rejoice because you see their faith. You see their hope. It's very beautiful to see someone who goes on for Jesus in hope. It's encouraging. It reminds you of how valuable the kingdom is that's keeping them going when everything is going wrong. Think of Paul himself. His hope was so firm that he went from one place to another and got beat up every time and just kept on going, going, going because he knew how valuable the kingdom of God was. And he was delighted when just a handful of people in a place would come and serve the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from their sins. He rejoiced if his labors even brought a few to eternal life. He looked for the day when he would be able to present them as a chaste virgin to the Lord. Some of you have known a godly person who is suffering. And you know what happens. Godly person who's suffering. You go to them. And who, you say, I'm going to go and try to encourage this, this poor person that's suffering so. And then they encourage you. They start speaking to you about all the hope and all the resources that we have in God. Because in the affliction, that's what they're focused on. And it becomes, I remember, many of you remember just a couple of years ago when when our brother Wayne Sproul was, uh, had, had terminal cancer and he was among us. And I remember uh, going to visit him, talking to him, and he was, you know, his mind was, was getting confused. And he said, am I losing my mind? I think I'm losing my mind. 
And I said to him, it doesn't matter if you lose your mind now because God will never lose his mind and you're in his hands. And he beamed. And when he beamed, that encouraged me because I saw the hope in him. He knew that that was true, that all of his hope was in God, that it was not in himself. And I was greatly encouraged. I went away encouraged. What a delight it is to see these things. Thank the Lord for it. Let me tell you where this patience and hope comes from. It comes from the word of God. There we have God's covenant. There you have the promises of God that are laid out to you. What he has done for you and what he's promised to do yet in the future. And when you have those promises, why are they worth anything? Because the guarantor of those promises is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if he's the one that's standing behind the promises, then those promises are certain. It's not a, I hope everything will work out okay. But it's a, God has promised, therefore I know that all that he has spoken will be done. That's the basis of our hope. Thank God whenever you see people who have embraced this hope and are serving God in the midst of affliction and hostility. Indeed, thank God as Paul did for all three things when you see them in his people. The work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. And be all the more thankful as Paul was because those who have these virtues have them in the sight of our God and Father. See how it says that at the end of verse 3? Indeed, we're always before God. Everything we do is before the face of God. And of course, that's true of um, other, other Christians as well, that everything they do is before the face of God. But true believers know and are cognizant of the fact that they are before the face of God. They do not do their works just to be seen by other people, but they're living consciously and conscientiously in the sight of God. They're doing this, this uh, work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope before the face of God. They're not, they're not hypocrites. If they were, then they would not continue when the affliction comes. They would run away, as so many do. So it should add to your thanks when you see sincerity before the face of God. And not only that, but also it should make you grateful that they are pleasing God when they live this way. God delights to see the work of faith and the labor of love and the endurance of hope in his people. It brings joy to God. It should make you thankful when you see his people pleasing him. You know how that is. If you see a child and you can tell that that child is the delight of his parents and that he is pleasing his parents, it makes you glad to see that. How much more should it make you glad when you see God's children living in such a way that they make him glad, thankful for the work of faith and the labor of love and the patience of hope? Okay, so we've seen that we ought to give thanks first whenever we see a faithful church. Secondly, that we ought to give thanks for the actual evidences of faithfulness, for the, the things that they are, are doing, the new life of faith, love, and hope that God has given them. And now thirdly, give thanks for faithful churches because you know that if they are faithful churches, that they are elect of God. Paul knew these Thessalonian believers were elect of God because of the way that the gospel had come to them. He says it in verse four and five. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God, for, or that word, Hati could be translated because, for or because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So you see that the gospel, first of all, you see that the gospel did indeed come to them. Okay, there, was, there was a message, the word of the gospel. Paul and Silas and Timothy, Paul in particular, preach the gospel to all who are in the synagogues, the synagogue at Thessalonica. Salvation comes by believing the gospel, believing the message that is preached, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem sinners, 
to redeem his people by dying on the cross for them. And that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God graciously brought Paul and Silas and Timothy into the synagogue at Thessalonica to make that message, that marvelous message known. But if it had only been the word of the gospel that God had sent to them, there would never have been a church in God and in Christ Jesus in Thessalonica. That is why Paul says that our gospel did not come to you in word only. How else did it come? He says that it also came to these Thessalonian believers, to you, he says, to you in distinction from the unbelievers, to you it came in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. In this they were distinguished from the ones who did not believe at Thessalonica. It is not about what they did, but it is about what God did. The reason they believed is because God brought the message to them accompanied by power, the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. So think about what this means. That it came with power means that it came to them with God's authority in such a way that they could not deny it because they saw it was got from God. They heard the voice of God. They knew it was from him when the, when the apostle preached. They were convinced by God that they were wretched sinners who could not save themselves. That message came home to them. Was it just an idle tale? They believed it. They believed that they were sinners before God who were fit only for judgment. And they were convinced when it was preached to them that this was from God, that Jesus really was the Son of God, that he really was sent by the Father to be the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world on the cross. And they were convinced that the message that said it was only by believing in him that anyone could be saved was also from God. It was of God. And hearing the voice of God, the word came to them, you see, with power. And that the gospel came in the Holy Spirit means that God the Holy Spirit came to them to give them life when the gospel was preached to them. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He's the life giver. He gives life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. He makes them alive so that they will repent and come to Jesus for forgiveness. He opens our blind eyes and he cleanses our heart so that the stubborn heart is taken away and a responsive heart to God is given to us in its place. The change is such a radical one that Jesus called it a new birth. He said, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must be born from above, or you can never enter the kingdom of God. And that the gospel came with much assurance means that these elect people were convinced that it was true. That's why they were willing to leave their idols and their families to follow these strangers that had come into their synagogue with this message of salvation. That's why they were willing to suffer, because they were sure that the message was true. But do not miss the point. Although the gospel was preached to all who were in the synagogue, it only came to those who were chosen by God with power and with the Holy Spirit and with much assurance. The others would have been saved if they had believed the gospel, but they would not because they could not. They were dead in their sins, and they wanted nothing to do with the living God and his salvation. That's the way we all are unless God has chosen us. And then he draws us by his powerful drawing, by sending the word in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And we are also told that God did something else. God sent messengers to the Thessalonians who themselves had been made alive. Paul and Silas and Timothy were these messengers. And when the gospel came with power in the Holy Spirit, the Thessalonians were able to see that Paul himself believed this, that Silas and Timothy believed this. They were able to see it lived out before them. It's hard to believe that a messenger is telling you the truth if he doesn't have the new life that he is preaching about. We will look at this more next week, where we'll see how the whole church of Thessalonica became a model to other churches so that God used their testimony. But we will, more, more of that next week, but for now, I want you to see here that election is the third reason that we have to give thanks. Because we know 
that anyone, wherever we see those people in that city or the other city who are in God, in Christ, we know that they were chosen by God. Sinners would never come to Him. They would never choose Him. They are too full of sin, too contrary to God, too much desiring to go their own way. They do not want to be punished, for sure, but neither do they want to be reconciled to God unless God draws them. You can preach to them all day, and they'll never come. But when someone does come to Christ to be saved, like the Thessalonians and the church did, you can be sure that the reason is because God had chosen them. Knowing your election of God, you see, they had not chosen Him, but He had chosen them. It is entirely of His grace that they had come, and that is why we give thanks. The glory all goes to our Father and to His Son and to the Holy Spirit. They are saved because He appointed them to salvation before the foundation of the world, not because of anything good that He saw in them or anything that they had done, but only because of His free love and grace that, was, that, that appointed them to salvation before they were even born. Thanks should be given to Him for having loved them, for having loved us who believe so well. He loved them even though they hated Him and would never have come to Him on their own. His power and His Spirit is what transforms. And for this, we give thanks. So, let us learn today, brothers and sisters, from Paul to thank God for every faithful church that we come into contact with, for every faithful believer that we come into contact with. Your words of thanks will help you to take a greater delight in God's saving work in the world and in His people. And it will cause you to yearn to see more of the fruits of God's work in your own life and in the people of God that you are acquainted with in your church and in other churches. And it will cause you to yearn that you would see more people brought into His kingdom and added to His church in every city, in every place. Please stand and let's bring our yearnings to Him in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving because there are people all over the world. There are people in this city. There are people in other cities that are in you, O oh Father, and in your Son, Christ Jesus. And we thank you that it is by your grace that there are people like that, people that were ruined, people that were given over to idols or people that were given over to their own self-righteousness, or whatever it was, Lord, wretched sinners all. And yet, Lord, by your grace, there are people all over the world, even today on this Lord's Day, that are calling on your name. Father, we give you the thanks and praise for your great mercy. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us a delight in these things. Father, have mercy on us and forgive us because we confess to you, Lord, that we have not been as thankful as we ought to be for the work that you do in the world, for, for these people, Lord, that you have called to be your own people from this wretched world. Father, we pray that you would cause us to, to see the glory of your church, to see the glory of, of you, O oh Father, and in calling them out of the darkness, in saving them, and providing for their salvation, in going to all the, the lengths to which you have gone to bring them to salvation. Father, we pray that we would so cherish this salvation that we would burst with joy when we see it in others, and that we would promote it in the world, that we would encourage each other to pursue it and to delight in it. Father, we're so dull. We're so blind. We're so cold. And we pray, O oh Lord, that, that you would visit us with your mercy, your grace, with your Holy Spirit, and that you would lift our hearts up to you, Lord, and that we would get a grip on reality, and that we would see the kingdom of God, and we would delight in it. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.